cells, and I'm going to try to cover the B cells as well because B cells are, in addition to what they do, are also antigen presenting cells. Uh, it's going to depend on time. So, antigen presenting cells, or APCs, uh, engulf antigens, break them into little fragments, and those fragments have antigenic determinants on them, and they present them to T cells for recognition. Uh, the major types of antigen presenting cells are dendritic cells, macrophages, and as I said, B cells. Dendritic cells are found in connective tissues and epidermis. We've talked about them. We mentioned them before through the course of the year. <clears throat> they are kind of mobile sentinels of boundary tissues, places where we interact with the outside world. They phagocytize pathogens that enter the tissues and then they get into the lymphatics and present those to T cells and the lymph nodes. They are the best of the antigen presenters that we know. They are a key link between innate and adaptive immunity. And there's a lot of evidence that they are very much involved in maintaining uh, immunological memory. So here is a dendritic cell. Macrophages are widely distributed in connective tissue and lymphoid organs. They present antigens to T cells. That not only activates the T cells, but it also activates the macrophage. And that activated macrophage becomes what we call an angry macrophage. That angry macrophage, in the terms of this author, is a voracious phagocytic killer. Uh, and it also triggers powerful inflammatory responses to recruit additional defenses. B lymphocytes don't activate naive T cells. They will only act T cell, activate T cells that have already seen their antigen once, but they are very good at presenting antigens to helper T cells and assisting the helper T cell and the products of that helper T cell feedback to the B lymphocyte and make it even better at doing its job. So. Overview, B and T lymphocytes. B lymphocytes, humoral, T lymphocytes, cellular. B lymphocytes produce antibodies that go in all the body fluids. Uh, T lymphocytes have to physically encounter their target. T lymphocytes do not secrete antibodies. B lymphocytes do. Uh, both are, come from red bone marrow. B lymphocytes do their development within the bone marrow. T lymphocytes have to finish their education and learn of self and non-self within the thymus. The effector cell of a B cell is a plasma cell that pumps out antibodies. Uh, and for T cells, it's a little more complex, as we'll see when we get to the T cells. We have cytotoxic T cells that kill other cells, helper T cells that help the immune response, and regulatory T cells that uh, participate in modulating an immune response. And both T and B have this memory function, a key feature of immunity. So let's look at that humoral immune response. When a B cell encounters its antigen, it provokes a humoral response, which means it produces antibodies. Those antibodies are very specific for antigenic determinants on antigens that are found on pathogens, and they will bind to them. Uh, it starts when a B cell's antigen binds to its surface receptor, and before a B cell has seen its uh, antigen, its antibodies will be produced, but they will only be inserted into the membrane. They won't be released and secreted into the general circulation. In the membrane, that antibody serves as an antigen surface receptor. When they are cross-linked, that triggers uh, media, uh, receptor-mediated endocytosis. The, that leads to clonal selection which leads to proliferation, as well as differentiation of the B cell, eventually into a plasma cell. Those plasma cells are antibody secreting cells. They secrete their antibody that bind to a specific antigenic determinant on a specific antigen. At a rate of about 2,000 molecules per second, they live for four to five days. Those antibodies circulate in humors, body fluids, that's why we call it a humoral response, such as blood and lymph, they will bind to any time, any antigen they find that marks them for destruction by the innate immune system or other adaptive mechanisms.
clones that don't become plasma cells become memory cells, and those memory cells provide Im immunological memory. They mount an immediate response to future ex exposures to the same antigen. So we get pro proliferation, uh, and we had these memory cells laying around. They already expressed their antibody on their surface. They've already distributed some of that antibody around. <clears throat> And now the antigen comes in, and now you don't have that delay that you had in the first response. And you get a re real powerful response, but you maintain the memory. So that first response is called the primary immune response, uh, and that involves cell proliferation, differentiation, expo after exposure to the antigen for the first time. So really it's the time to go from a naive B-cell clone to a plasma producing clone. And the lag for that is about a week, three to six days. At that point, peak levels of antibodies are going to be reached in about 10 days, which also happens to be, coincidentally, maybe not, but by evolution, about the time that viruses start to shed from the cells that they infect. After about 10 days, the antibodies uh, begin to decline. But the next time you see that antigen, whenever, uh, because of memory, you get a secondary immune response. And that re-exposure to the same antigen uh, triggers those memory cells. So we don't have to go through that initial lag phase to generate those memory cells or those plasma cells. Those sensitized memory cells respond within a few hours, not within days. Their antibody levels are going to peak in two to three days, and they're going to peak much higher than they did in the initial uh, response. Antibodies that are produced have also been uh, changed, modified, uh, mutated so that they have even better affinity, the better ability to bind to their antigen. And those antibody levels will remain high for weeks to months upon second exposure. So if we look here, <clears throat> if you immunize someone on day zero, if you followed it out three to six days, you're going to get a peak, that's your primary immune response, that's usually an IgM response, that'll mean a little more a little later. Uh, that will wane as time goes on, but it, the next time you get exposed to that antigen, it'll very quickly go up really huge amount higher, uh, and the types of antibodies you'll get will be the IgG, the IgA, and they will bind better. But that is only for that specific antigen. If you get another exposure to a different antigen, you have to do the whole thing over again for that antigen. So there are a few different ways you can get humoral immunity. Uh, two common ones are active and passive. Active immunity occurs when a B cell encounters its antigen and produces a specific antibody against them. There are two ways you can get active humoral immunity. You can get it, as we've been talking about so far, naturally acquired. If you are infected with a bacteria or a virus, your B cells will start to produce antibodies. First time, they will produce a little bit, uh, enough to clear the virus or the, ant the, antibi uh, the bacteria. And the second time, you'll see it, you'll be stronger and faster. The same thing is true with artificially acquired, except instead of encountering the actual bacteria or virus, you are given an injection of a dead or very sick attenuated pathogen. Uh, and when you do that, <clears throat> you are deliberately exposing for the primary immune response uh, so that you don't have the pathogen to give you the symptoms of a primary of a, an infection, but you do generate the antibodies that will protect you when you see it in a natural form, you will have a secondary response all set to go. Passive humoral immunity occurs when you are given antibodies into the body. B cells aren't challenged with antigen. You don't get memory from this. Protection ends when those antibodies you've been injected with or supplied with degrade. And there are two ways of passive passive humoral immunity coming about. The first is naturally acquired. 
naturally acquired happens uh, when babies are fed uh, or when they are in utero through the placenta. Antibodies from mom make their way to the infant and the infant is protected from whatever mom was protected against at the time. The second type is artificially acquired, and again, this involves an injection. This could be an injection of serum, uh, such as gamma globulin. The protection you get from that is immediate, but it ends when the antibodies are degraded in the body. Uh, so you were given an anti-serum to a snake bite, for example, that would be passive humoral immunity. So humoral immunity can be active or passive. Active and passive can both be naturally uh, acquired or artificially acquired. For active immunity, naturally acquired means infection. Artificially means vaccinated. Passively, naturally acquired means getting antibodies from mom or getting injected with antibodies. And those antibodies are also called immunoglobulins. They are the proteins secreted by plasma cells. If you separate the proteins in blood, you, one of the peaks you will see is the gamma globulin peak. Those are immunoglobulins. Uh, if we knew what they were specific for, we could call them antibodies. They're each capable of binding specifically with an antigen, an antigenic determinant, when detected by B cells. And they're grouped into one of five immunoglobulin classes. The basic structure of an antibody is a T or a Y-shaped monomer. That monomeric antibody actually consists of four polypeptides linked together by disulfide bonds. And those four chains are too heavy and too light. The two heavy chains are identical. They have a hinge region uh, where you would make the T or the Y. Uh, and the two light chains are identical. At the edges of the heavy and light chains that come together are variable regions of those heavy and light chains. And where those variable regions come together is where you get an antigen binding site. The stem is made up of constant regions, and that's the area that determines what class of antibody you have, whether it's IG, IM, IA. Uh, th this is the effector region of the antibody, and different um, constant regions will make for different ways that antibodies do what they do. Uh, common functions in all antibodies are types of cells and chemicals that they can bind to, how the antibody class functions to eliminate antigens, some antibodies fix complements, some circulate in blood, some are found in other body secretions. So here is our monomeric antibody. This is one antibody made up of four chains, two heavy, two light. Uh, this is the stem region, which is a constant region that determines what type of antibody you have. This is a variable region, this is a variable region, and when these two variable regions come together, they have the ability to bind to something, and if we are producing soluble antibody to it, we have already seen whatever that something is. This is a three-dimensional filling structure of the same idea. Here's our antigen binding sites. Here's our constant region, hinge region. So those classes of antibodies are IgM, IgA, IgD, IgG, and IgE, MADG. Uh, IgM is a pentamer. It's made up of five antibodies, five of those monomers joined together. Uh, it's the first antibody we, we release. It's the first antibody in the membrane of B cells. Uh, it's a very good agglutinating agent. Uh, it will pull things out of solution. It's very good at fixing and activating complement. Uh, and it's, uh, again, part of the primary immune response. IgA antibody is the secretory antibody. It's a monomer or a dimer. Sometimes the constant regions connect end to end, so you have four antigen binding sites pointing in each two in each direction. It's found in mucus and other secretion, uh, very important to help prevent the entry of pathogens into the body. So here's IgM, here's our pentameric form of IgM, this would be secreted form of IgM. Here's an IgA dimer. 
IgD is a monomer that's attached to the surface of B cells. It's found on B cells. It's really involved as part of development of B cells. It's uh, going to help the B cells learn self from non-self, and then it's not going to be used after that. We don't find IgD on plasma cells. IgG is a monomer. About 75 to 85% of the antibodies in the plasma, not that it's the most made, uh, it's the result of secondary and late primary responses. IgG has the ability to cross the placenta barrier. IgE has uh, been linked with infections. Uh, it's a way we use to fight parasitic infections, uh, and it's been linked to allergies. A lot of allergies have IgE. Uh, based antibodies, and the reason for that is that IgE attaches to mast cells and basophils, and when it's activated, it causes them to release histamine. So you can imagine that when you have an allergy, the first thing you do is grab antihistamines. So IgD, B cell surface, part of uh, part of the development of in, uh, anti uh, B cells. IgG, probably the most studied of the antibodies and IgE. Plasma B cells switch from one class to another. They do that as part of their development uh, most. Uh, and even though that's the case, the variable regions are the same in those antibodies, so they bind to the same antigen. Most responses will start out as an IgM response, and as the plasma cell proliferates and matures, it will switch to IgG for secondary response. Uh, it can also switch to the pentameric IgM for some antigens. Others will switch to IgA. Others will switch to IgE. The antibodies work to target specific antigens or antigenic determinants on an antigen, and they have some mechanisms for taking care of those antigens. They don't destroy the antigens themselves. They mark them and tag them, and then they are used to uh, be eliminated. They are going to form an antigen-antibody complex or an immune complex. The mechanisms used to uh, target the destruction by antibodies include neutralization, agglutination, precipitation, and complement fixation. So in neutralization, just binding the antibody to uh, something keeps that something from doing what it's supposed to do. So this is very good to keep viruses from infecting cells, very good to uh, neutralize bacterial toxins. Uh, it can also um, help direct phagocytosis. Agglutination uh, is going to bind the same determinant, same time, two arms, you cross-link them, you get a clumping, and that clumping is called agglutination. We've actually seen this process when you did artificial blood typing, or when we do real blood typing, we look for this agglutination reaction, a clumping of materials, and that clumping gets them out of circulation. Precipitation is very similar to that, but this involves molecules instead of cells. They get cross-linked, and when they get cross-linked, they precipitate out of solution, and those complexes out of solution are easier for phagocytes to find. And fixation of complement means you can activate the complement cascade, uh, and antibodies, are some of them are very good at doing that. That triggers complement cascade, which we said earlier leads to cell lysis and other things that happen when complement is fixed, including amplification of inflammation and opsonization. So when an antibody antigen complex forms, we can get rid of the antigen by neutralization, agglutination, precipitation, complement activation, uh, many of which enhance phagocytosis, all of which really lead to increased inflammation and ultimately cell lysis. Parasitic infections by worms, such as Ascarius or Schistosomiasa, require uh, different immune strategies. Worms are too big for us to engulf and eat with macrophages. So in this case, they are coated with IgE antibodies. That uh, causes the release of histamines and other toxins 
that kill the large worms from the outside in. Monoclonal antibodies are very important clinical and research tools. Monoclonal antibodies are made by producing hybridomas, means you take a cell that produces an antibody that you're interested in and a cell that is a tumor, which has immortality. And when you combine those two cells, you get a cell that lives forever and produces the same antibody. Those antibodies are used in research. They are used in clinical testing. Uh, if you've ever taken a pregnancy test, you've used one of those. They can be used in cancer treatment. And they are more and more being used as drug therapies. When you see a drug advertised or you read about a drug and it ends in MAB, that is a monoclonal antibody. So antigen antibody complexes don't destroy the antigens directly. They prepare them for destruction by other defenses. They go after extracellular part pathogens. They don't invade solid tissues unless a lesion is, pre lesion is present. They uh, are some recent exceptions to that found. Uh, if it can act intracellularly, if it's attached to a virus and gets in. But so far, we believe that's a minor 